This is the final section of chapter 13, uh, catalysis. So we've learned that the rate of a chemical reaction is affected by the concentration of the reactants, and it's also affected by temperature. So if we want to control a reaction, make it go faster or slower, do what we want, we can alter those things. But there are limits to what concentrations are possible. Um, if you're dealing with an aqueous solution, things have limits of solubility. And so maybe the solubility limit is 0.1 molar for your reactant. You can't get a higher concentration than that. So you're not going to be able to speed it up that way. Temperature has limits. Not only the limit of what you can apply to the system, but also there are limits to what the system can take. Some compounds will decompose at higher temperatures. And so that's not always uh, a possibility for controlling your chemical reaction. So another thing we can do to control a chemical reaction is to use a catalyst. And what a catalyst does is it increases the rate of a reaction without being consumed. It might appear on the surface to be one of the reactants, but it's not because the reactants get converted into products the catalyst stays there, okay? And the way a catalyst works is that it provides an alternate mechanism to that rate determining step. We learned that the rate determining step is the, the hold up, the high activation energy, that barrier that the reaction has to get over. And so what the catalyst does is it offers an alternate pathway that has a lower activation energy. And so everything goes faster because of that. So let's look at the decomposition of ozone. This is of some interest to anyone who lives on the planet because of our concern for the ozone layer, which you know, protects us from harmful ultraviolet radiation. So ozone is O3, and it can react with an oxygen atom to form two oxygen molecules. Now, the products there are very nice because we breathe oxygen, right? But we need the ozone in that layer, and so we don't want it decomposing too much. Well, the uncatalyzed reaction happens by a single elementary step. So it, the O3 reacts with an oxygen atom and goes through a transition state and then to the products. This is the uncatalyzed pathway. There's a relatively high activation energy, and so this is a slow rate of reaction. So it does not happen very quickly. Chlorine atoms, though, um, serve to catalyze this reaction. They, they make available another pathway. And here in the red, we have the catalyzed pathway. It actually has two transition states, but both of them have lower activation energies than this original uncatalyzed reaction. So when there are chlorine atoms present in the atmosphere, then the, the ozone reacts more quickly to form oxygen. Do you know where the chlorine atoms in the atmosphere come from? Chlorofluorocarbons. Chloro the decomposition of chlorofluorocarbons um, puts chlorine atoms into the atmosphere and that catalyzes this reaction. So that's one of the big concerns for uh, restricting CFC use. So the mechanism for the catalytic destruction involves two steps. So a chlorine atom um, reacts with the O3 to make ClO and oxygen. And then this ClO reacts with, another, with an oxygen atom and reforms the chlorine atom and makes O2. And what do we know about the steps in a mechanism? What do they have to add up to? They need to add up to the overall reaction. So if we add these guys up, we see that we've got a chlorine as a reactant and a chlorine as a product. And we've got ClO as a product and ClO as a reactant. So this chlorine that's getting used up is getting regenerated over here. We can cancel those out. This ClO that's being formed gets used up over here. And so the overall reaction is the same, O3 plus O, forming 2O2. 
So looking at the overall reaction, there's no difference. And yet in the rate of the reaction, there's a great difference. We often indicate the presence of a catalyst by writing it over the reaction arrow. So the rate limiting step is much lower, so the reaction happens at a much faster rate. Yes? What would, would, be, what, would that rate be? Um, I do not know the difference in the rate off the top of my head. The thing is, because the catalyst is not used up, one chlorine atom can catalyze the reaction of millions and billions of ozone molecules because it just goes over and over and over and over again. And so just a little bit of chlorine can affect the destruction of the ozone layer in a, in a, in a larger way than you might expect. Yes? It's just still there. So the chlorine that gets reproduced here then just goes on and reacts with another, with another ozone molecule. So one of my analogies for um, a catalyst, so here's a fence. And here we've got some little kindergartners. And they need to get over the fence. And because they're small and the fence is kind of big, it takes them a while to climb over the fence, right? That there's an activation energy. There's a barrier they have to get over the fence because before they can go and continue on to the playground or wherever kindergartners go. I have one, but I don't know what he does. Well, there's, there's two ways you could think of a catalyst. One way you could think of the catalyst is here's the teacher. Wait, that's, that's not, yeah, three arms. Uh, I think kindergarten teachers should have three arms. Wouldn't that be helpful? I personally think that every time you give birth to a child, you should grow a new arm. And that would make, you know, dealing with the children much easier, although it would make shopping kind of challenging. But so here's, here's our teacher. We'll give her a little bit of hair because she's not bald. Okay. So there's the teacher. These kindergartners are going to get over the fence faster if the teacher picks them up and lifts them over the fence. The teacher can lift many children over the fence. It's not like a reactant where the teacher and one child go over the fence and they go off and go to recess. The teacher stays there and helps multiple reactants over. The other way you could do this is you could lower, you could take this bar and, and pull it out and drop it down. Well, now we've got a bar in front of the teacher's face. That's not. <laughs> and I cut off the top of her head, too. Anyway, you get the idea. By, by lowering the fence, the children can get over more quickly. So that's what a catalyst does, is it helps to get rid of that barrier to the reaction. And these chlorine atoms are formed from the man-made chlorofluorocarbons. And this happens by photodissociation. So it's the sunlight in the atmosphere that causes the chlorofluorocarbons to break down and release chlorine atoms. Chlorine atoms are not the natural state of chlorine, the element, are they? Chlorine is one of those diatomic molecules, and it's, it prefers to be Cl2. And so we've got these chlorine atoms, and because they do not have a nice octet of electrons, they are more reactive than just chlorine gas would be. Yes? Well. Is it possible then that the chlorine atoms that are up there will find each other and then become non-reactive? Yes, they will do that to some extent. Yeah. So the chlorine atom is not necessarily going to be up there forever catalyzing this reaction. It could react with something else and, and be taken out of the picture. Any other questions? So diatomic chlorine is the most reactive and it's my catalyst. Yes, diatomic chlorine, Cl2, does not catalyze this reaction. Let's see. Yep, that's okay. Another example of catalysis is a catalytic converter. We live in California. 
all of our cars have to have catalytic converters. Did you ever wonder what those darn things do? Catalyze. They catalyze a reaction, right? So here's an illustration from your book, and I know that's really small, but it's in your car, and it's got a solid surface that has, it's a ceramic surface with a high surface area, and on the surface you've got finely divided uh, platinum, rhodium, or palladium. It's a solid catalyst, and what happens is the pollutants such as my favorite here, no, hmm. and carbon monoxide that are produced as the fuel burns in your car, they come through and pass this catalytic converter and it catalyzes the reaction of these to form nitrogen and carbon dioxide, which are much less harmful, right? The other thing that um, happens in the catalytic converters, you can end up with fuel fragments. So the fuel did not burn completely. If you have a really pure fuel and it burns completely, you should just have carbon dioxide and water. But it doesn't always burn completely, and so you get these fuel fragments. We don't really like those hanging around in the air either. And so in the catalytic converter, these are um, converted into carbon dioxide and water, and so the combustion gets finished by the catalytic converter. Yes? Does something have to be reactive to be a catalyst? Like, is that just how it works, or can you have, like, salt as a catalyst? It, it, the catalyst, what functions as a catalyst will be, depend on what the reaction is and what the mechanism of that reaction is. And so, you know, platinum, uh, rhodium, and palladium are not highly reactive metals. They're not going to do much to anything else, but they do catalyze this reaction. So that's a good question. You can't just have anything being a catalyst. But the catalyst itself does not have to be something that's real reactive. In fact, it generally is not real reactive. It's going to be react. It's going to um, catalyze that particular reaction, but it's not really undergoing a reaction itself. It's not being convert it into any sort of a product. <coughs> so in theory, uh, your catalytic converter should last forever, right? But they don't. Can you think of a reason why they might not? Well, because it's a machine, yeah, and everything breaks. But is there anything moving in the catalytic converter? No. But what, what do you have coming through there? Exhaust. What's in the exhaust? All kinds of junk, right? And so this is just me thinking off the top of my head, but I think what happens is eventually you just get so much gunk from the fuel that gets deposited on there that it stops, stops working, right? And, you know, it, it would be really awesome if we could purify the gasoline so that we wouldn't get all that junk out, but the process of purifying the gasoline would require so much energy and money that it's not cost effective. So, you know, we go for a balance. There are two basic kind, types of catalysis, uh, homogeneous and heterogeneous. And so we know what these words homogeneous and heterogeneous means, mean, and when we apply them to catalysis, we're talking about the phase of the reactant and the catalyst. So we talked about catalytic destruction of ozone by chlorine atoms. Okay, the ozone and the chlorine atoms are both in the gas phase. They're in the same physical state, and so this is homogeneous catalysis. Heterogeneous catalysis, the example would be what happens in the catalytic converter. You have a solid catalyst, but then your reactants are in the gas phase. And so you have two different states, and so that's heterogeneous. And here we have illustrations where the catalyst um, and the reactant are both in the same state, they're both gases, and here we have a solid catalyst and the reactants and products are in the gas state. So there are chlorine atoms in the atmosphere, and what do we know about gases and mixing? Gases mix really well, and they make homogeneous mixtures, right? 
So if we've got a certain level of chlorine atoms in the atmosphere over Fresno, it's going to be roughly the same over Sweden or Antarctica. But what they observed back in 1985 is that in September and October, over Antarctica, there's this huge hole that develops in the ozone layer. And then it goes away again. But every Arctic spring, it's in the southern hemisphere, so it's opposite of our, um, so September, October is spring down there. Every September and October, this hole develops. And the question was, why? Why does this happen? If the chlorine atoms are catalyzing it, and they're spread out uniformly over the globe, why do we get this hole down there? Well, it turns out that chlorine atoms from those chlorofluorocarbons get bound up in substances such as ClO and O2. Um, this is one example. There are other compounds that can form because, like I mentioned, chlorine atoms are fairly reactive. And so that they can, um, they can bind with oxygen and, and nitrogen dioxide. And when they're bound up in these molecules, then they're not free to catalyze the destruction of ozone. So this is a good thing, right? Well, over, over the poles, um, there is a particular type of cloud called polar stratospheric clouds. Most clouds have um, fine droplets of liquid water. It's really cold at the South Pole, and so those particles are in the form of ice. And it turns out that the, those ice particles catalyze reactions like this one that release chlorine into the atmosphere. So we've got the chlorine atoms that were nicely bound up in these uh, different compounds, which kept them from destroying the ozone. But then we've got these clouds down here, and those catalyze the release of chlorine gas. Well, here's the chlorine. That's not so bad. It's the chlorine atoms. But what happens is, in the Antarctic spring, the sunlight, because what happens at the poles in the winter? It's dark pretty much all day long and all night long, right? And then in the summer, it's light all night and all day. Very, very crazy to think about. But in the spring, as you get, start to get more sunlight, then the sunlight catalyzes the dissociation of chlorine into chlorine atoms. And then these atoms can destroy ozone. And so this will continue until it warms up enough that those stratospheric clouds melt. The ice crystals melt, and then the catalysis of this process stops. And, and then the, destru the uh, accelerated destruction of the ozone stops. But the result is that you've got this ozone hole that forms every Arctic spring and lasts around six to eight weeks. It's just kind of interesting. So here's another type of reaction that can be catalyzed. The hydrogenation of double bonds. So here we've got ethene. And that can react with hydrogen to form ethane gas. Normally, this is a relatively slow reaction at room temperature because um, it's the hydrogen bond in the hydrogen molecule that has to be broken. And that's fairly strong. And so there's a high activation energy because you have to break that bond to get this hydrogen molecule to add across this double bond. But if we have finely divided platinum, palladium, or nickel present, the reaction will occur quite rapidly. And the reason it does that is because when the hydrogen adsorbs to the, the uh, catalyst surface, it strains the bond between the two hydrogen atoms, making it easier to break. Let's see, do I have a picture? I do, yes. And so there's four steps in this. The first step is adsorption. This is heterogeneous catalysis. Adsorption, the reactants here in the gas phase adsorb, stick to, the solid catalyst. And then you have diffusion. Diffusion is where these adsorbed gas um, 
molecules, atoms, they'll diffuse, they'll actually move around a bit and until they approach each other because there has to be a collision, right, in order for the reaction to occur. So they're going to move around and then you have reaction when they come in contact with each other and then you have desorption where they leave that solid surface again and come off. Any questions? When they partially hydrogenate vegetable oil, they use a catalyst much like this to do that. And that's how you end up with trans fatty acids. That's really more of a subject for biochemistry, but I think it's, it's interesting. It's because of the catalyst that you can end up with the trans, trans fatty acids. If you're interested in that, I'd be happy to explain it to you later. So we've talked about homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis and three examples of that. Another type of catalysis involves enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts. So you think about a living organism and most living organisms have a very limited temperature range in which they can stay alive, right? Humans, uh, maximum temperature is about 106. You get much above that and you start to get brain damage and that we know is not good and that'll kill you, right? You get too low, it's hypothermia and that'll kill you also. And that's really not that much lower than body temperature 98.6 Fahrenheit. So we have got this limited temperature range. The concentrations of the reactants in these biological reactions um, are also limited. They can be altered, but not terribly much. And the reactions that are occurring within the organism are generally quite slow under the conditions in which the organism can remain alive. So how do you speed up the reactions? You use a catalyst. Um, enzymes are generally large protein molecules. They're really large and complicated, and we're not going to go into what they look like. We're just going to think of them as blobs. But these blobs that we call enzyme have, have an active site. There's a particular part of that blob where the action occurs. And the reactant will bind to that active site. They call the reactant the substrate. So the substrate binds to the active site through intermolecular forces. So things like hydrogen bonds and uh, dipole-dipole forces, it will be attracted to this particular part of the enzyme molecule. They sometimes talk about sort of fitting together like a lock and a key. It's just the right shape to fit in there and line up all these intermolecular forces and so it's a really comfortable spot for us. A little bit like a spaceship landing on this landing pad. When the substrate is in the active site, the activation energy of the reaction is lowered. And so here's an illustration that a general binding mechanism, you have the enzyme plus the substrate are forming this enzyme substrate complex. And this is very, happens very quickly. And then the enzyme substrate complex reacts producing the enzyme again and the product. So here we have a picture which is sometimes easier to see. So here comes the substrate and it, it docks in here. It fits in here really nicely, just like this was made for it, because it was. And then this being stuck in here, a lot of times what happens is there's a bond that needs to break. And when it docks in here, it strains the bond, making it much easier to break. And so the bond can break and then the products go off. And then the enzyme is sitting there waiting for another substrate to come in and for the whole process to happen over again. Here's a specific example. Sugar, what we call sugar, uh, table sugar, is sucrose. And here's um, a model of sucrose. It's actually a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule, and they're bonded together right here with this oxygen between them. When you metabolize or digest sugar, this bond needs to be broken. And so we've got this reaction between sucrose and water, and we end up with glucose and fructose. And this bond gets broken, 
and the, a, the O and the H from the water molecule go on to the glucose molecule, and the hydrogen go on to the oxygen of the fructose molecule. And then you've got two simple sugars. Well, that bond is relatively strong. And so to break that at room temperature or at body temperature, it's not going to happen very quickly because there's a significant activation energy. When this sucrose molecule comes in and binds in the active site of the enzyme, that bond gets strained. There's all these different intermolecular forces that are making the rest of this molecule really comfortable, but in that process, it's stretching that bond. That makes the bond much easier to break. Making the bond easier to break lowers the activation energy and increases the rate. So the presence of the en enzyme increases the rate of the um, reaction. Yes? For all enzymes um, catalysts? Yes, all enzymes are catalysts. That is their function. There are different kinds of enzymes. They're not all proteins, but most of them are. So do all enzymes function the same way by like orientation, like pulling them apart? They, they all have an aspect of orientation, but it's not all this same idea of stretching a bond that needs to get broken. It's pointing on the wrong screen. It's not all that same idea. Sometimes it's that it holds it in a particular orientation so that this other reactant molecule can come in. Um, there's a variety of different ways that they act. Yes? If an inhibitor comes into the active site, does that lower the rate of the catalyst? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Any other questions? The enzymes in the study of enzymes is just really amazing um, the more you learn about it. Enzymes give the organism tremendous control over the reactions in the body. They almost act like switches. It's like, okay, we need more glucose. Okay, so we, we need to break down the fructose. Let's, let's put out some sucrase, the enzyme that decomposes the sucrose. And, oh, we're done with that? Okay, let's shut this off. And so your body has these um, mechanisms, series of reactions that control what enzymes get formed, you can activate and deactivate enzymes, and so it allows your body to control all sorts of things. You know, you've heard of the fight or flight mechanism, right? You get scared, and your body, you know, you get adrenaline flowing, and your heart rate goes up, and you're ready to either fight somebody or run away, right? That's a whole series of chemical reactions in your body that are sending epinephrine, and they're doing all these different things. Enzymes are extremely specific. They usually catalyze one specific reaction. And so sucrase catalyzes the hydrolysis of sucrose. That's all it does. It doesn't do anything else. They can speed up reaction rates by factors as large as a billion. So it can make the reaction rate a billion times faster. That's big, right? It's really big. Not all of them do that, but it's possible. Many of the substances that inhibit enzymes are very toxic. Because that one enzyme molecule doesn't just catalyze the hydrolysis of one sucrose molecule. It does billions of them. It does one and then another, and it's just, you know, it's lifting kindergartners over the fence. Well, you take out that one teacher, and now you've got this whole line of kindergartners that can't get over the fence very quickly. Your book says it's a little bit like um, you've got a toll booth, which, you know, in California, thankfully, we're not familiar with toll booths too much, but you get a toll booth, and you get one car stalled at the, to stalled at the toll booth, blocks everything up, right? You get a fender bender on 99, and it really congests everything, right? Because it takes out this whole pathway. So taking out one enzyme molecule can stop the reaction of billions of substrate molecules. So a lot of toxins act on enzymes. We can also use that to our advantage. If you don't like a pest, 
You don't like an insect? Well, let's find something that inhibits a really important enzyme in them. And that's how a lot of pesticides work. And ideally, you'll find something that inhibits that in the insects that you want to kill and doesn't do anything to people or doesn't do much to people because you don't want to take out all the people too. But there's, there's different mechanisms of enzyme inhibition, and of course that's, that's a subject for another class. End of chapter 13.